John 3.16 obviously finds itself in the context of like chapter 3 of, 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 uh, of the book of John. And if you know, if you know the Bible, like um, you know that this happens in the conversation that Jesus is having with one of the religious leaders, if not the religious leader in this time, implied by the fact that the Lord tells him, you know, you're the teacher of Israel. Don't you know these things? Right. So this 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 John 316 verse that we know so well finds itself in a conversation that this religious leader has come to Jesus because he's observed that Jesus has just something that he's missing with all his education and everything that he had going for himself. Nicodemus was wise enough to know that there was something missing, right? And so he comes to the Lord, right, as, as you know the story, and he asks the Lord, you know, well, he comes complimenting the Lord. He tells him, you know, we know that you're of God because no one can do the things that you do. And, and the Lord, never once for, for, for mincing words, goes right to the point. You know, he tells Nicodemus, look, Nicodemus, uh, verily, verily, I say to you that unless a man is born again, cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so the Lord the Lord goes right to the point, right? Like he says, the issue, Nicodemus, is that with all you got going for yourself, with all your religious preparations, with all just everything, if you are not born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. At which Nicodemus says, like, how? How can these things be so? You know, and then so the Lord begins this explanation to him. But there around, what was it? Verse 14 through 15 the Lord gives Nicodemus a very useful illustration because Nicodemus being a teacher of the word, the Lord reminds him of something that happened in Numbers 21. And the Lord basically tells Nicodemus, not in these words, but basically tells him, you know, you remember when Moses and the children of Israel were, were in the wilderness and there were snakes that came and they bit the children of Israel because they were murmuring. You know, they were saying, oh, we, we're tired of this worthless manna. You know, God's sending them bread from heaven. And the people are saying, oh, we're just sick and tired of this bread that God is providing. And so the Bible tells us there in Numbers that snakes came and they bit the people. And so, the, and so Moses goes, he prays to the Lord, and the Lord says to Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it in the middle of the camp. And tell the people that whoever looks at that bronze, bronze serpent, whoever looks at it will be healed. And the Lord says to Nicodemus, just like the serpent was lifted up, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the being born again, the, the whole topic of the conversation that John 3.16 finds itself in is the topic of being born again. And when we're born again, we're giving a new nature, right? The new nature now that it's coming from God himself, the spirit of God coming to live inside of us. Second Corinthians 5.21, there it tells us that he who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness or the perfection of God in him. This is the... This is the basic, the simple gospel that when we are born again, our sinful nature then is, is exchanged for the righteousness of Jesus. The only thing that God will accept into heaven is the righteousness of Jesus. And so this is what the Lord is talking to Nicodemus about, about being born again. So John 3.16 basically is the gospel in condensed form. It, it, it packs this dynamite power that I believe God would have detonate in the life of our churches, definitely in our personal lives. That we, like right now, a pastor was talking about the, that just simple, right? That God's people, we need to be about the word, about prayer. And this morning I was telling the congregation and fellowship. Very, very basic. This is, this is not complicated. We've, we've made things complicated, but the simplicity of the gospel is, 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 is here in John 3.16 that is telling us that we must be born again. Now, in the gospel, in the, in the, in the further study of the gospel, it does involve a kingdom that's to come. It does involve a, a life of knowing God in, in you know, long term as we walk with him. But all of that will not help you unless first you are born again. And I think that it is an error that we as Christians who've been walking with the Lord for quite some time, sometimes we 
come, we, we come to a wrong conclusion that the gospel, John 3, 16, is sort of like for believers, for, for beginner, be beginning believers. And then when we are now like years into our walk with the Lord, it's like we move on to uh, more advanced things. Um, I, I think it was Paul Washer I was listening to one day talking about like, we, no, we, we never outgrow the gospel. The gospel is something that we as believers grow in, yes, but the simplicity of it, not simplistic, right, but simplicity of the gospel is something, man, that we just need to take to heart. And so my, my heart, as I, as I share with you guys, because, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, an evening, a Sunday evening study usually is attended by, by believers, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that are faithful, you know, and... Um, so my heart is to, uh, as we consider this, is to edify, right? To, to remind us that we've been walking with the Lord for some time of the simplicity of what we've been handed and what we need to share. And then also in hopes that maybe someone in here or someone watching online uh, would hear this message and, and, and grasp the fact that there is a God that we've sinned against. And the God that we've sinned against loves us so much that he would be willing to give his only begotten son that we would not perish but have everlasting life. I want to give you six observations from John 3.16 for us to consider with the intent and the heart that it would draw us closer to God and that it would make us, uh, that it would make our hearts just full of worship to him. Okay, so, so the first thing I want to I wanna share with you here in, in John 3, 16, as far as the gospel goes, is that the gospel has its origin, very, very simple, it has its origin in God. Because John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. Now, this is, again, so basic, right? And you would think that it's a no-brainer to say, well, of course the gospel has its origin in God. But I want to pose to you that in, especially the culture that we're living in, in the generation that we're living in, we are a very narcissistic generation, right? Everything is about us. And so even, sadly, the gospel, sometimes it would seem, um, begins with us. You know, God loves you. You know, like, oh, I'm so special, you know, that God loves me. And yeah, God does love you. And in a sense, you know, we are uh, obviously valuable to God that he would, he would like pour out his blood. But I want to I wanna, I wanna suggest to you and I want to post to you, and I think that I have biblical grounds here, that the gospel is not primarily about you and I. The gospel primarily is about God. You know, the Bible begins with God and ends with God. You know, you guys know how the Bible begins, right? In the beginning, God. That's, that's how the Bible begins. That's the, that's the, that's the, the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, in the beginning God. And the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation twenty two twenty one, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So it's like the, the Bible from cover to cover is not about us. It is about God. And, and such, a, such a simple truth, I feel like I need to emphasize because often we come, again, to the wrong conclusion that the gospel is because God loves me so much. He does love you, but it's not, it's not primarily about us. Romans 3, Romans 3, 10 through 11 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. The fact that you and I are here on a Sunday evening worshiping God, our hearts bursting with love for God, is because God was so merciful to us that when we were lost, when we weren't seeking Him, we were not desiring Him. God did not find me desiring Him, reading a Bible, doing good things. God found me I'd be embarrassed to tell you how God found me. As I'm sure a lot of you guys would tell me the same thing. But it was God's faithfulness and it was God's love that pursued us, right? The one, he, he's the one who initiated this relationship that now we have with him. And so I think it is good for us to come back to the basics where we, where we remember, you know what? Like this, this relationship, this gospel, it, it has its origin in God. That whoever believes in him, John 3.15 says, would not perish but have everlasting eternal life. 
Its origin is in God. One of the, one of, one of the verses that really drives this home to me, and actually it was years ago that I heard John Piper uh, just impact me personally with, with, with this fact. It's it found in uh, Isaiah 43, 25. This really, I get, this really puts me personally in my place, and I think it should put us in our places as it, as it, as it refers to our relationship with God. I, even I, says the Lord, I, even I am he who blots out your transgressions, but look, for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I love that verse because it just really tells me why. Why he would forgive us, right? It, it doesn't say there, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions because I love you so much and you deserve my love. But rather it says, for my own sake, I will not remember your sins. Or Psalms 25, 11. This is, this is, the, right, this is the right way to, to approach God. Look, asking God for forgiveness. He says there in, in Psalms 25, 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, O Lord, Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. See, when we come to the Lord, and if you find yourself right now uh, distant from the Lord, or maybe even separated from the Lord, man, like I'm, I'm like pleading with you, and I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to show you here that, that the way we approach God is, is not, Lord, here I am. Lord, aren't you happy that I'm at church? You know? No, the way we approach God is, Lord, please, for your name's sake, Lord, because I've heard you're merciful. Because I heard that you are willing to forgive, Father. Please forgive me for your name's sake. Oh, Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Yeah, the gospel, the gospel finds its origin in God. John 3.16 finds itself in the context of a conversation of a guy who says to the Lord, How can these things be? That was the last that was the last thing that Nicodemus says. And then the Lord goes on and he starts telling him about how these things could be. And he brings up the serpent in the wilderness. I mean, Im imagine this, right? Like, you know, here you have a merciful God delivered a group of people from Egypt, right? Like they were in slavery. The Lord did not owe it to them to deliver them from slavery. But he does, miraculously parts the Red Sea. And then he's promised them a uh, I was just talking to someone about this. Like, like when the Lord took them out of Egypt, the Lord took them out of Egypt not with the intent that they would walk around a wilderness for 40 years. The Lord took them out of Egypt and told them, look it, I'm taking you out of Egypt, and I'm, I want to give you a land that flows with milk and honey, right? I don't know what you imagine when you hear milk and honey, but it's sort of like in my mind I think like, oh, like there's cows, Right? And there's, there's bees, which implies flowers, right? Like, so, so when, it, when it says, I want to give you a land that flows with milk and honey, it's talking about this, like, beautiful, like, land, right? That was the Lord's purpose for them. And, and in Deuteronomy, it tells us, right, that it had taken them 11 days to get to the promised land. But we know, right, because of their rebellion or whatever, like, they wandered for 40 years. And yet the Lord in his mercy provides for them bread from heaven. But constantly, they're like, eh, we should have died in Egypt, and just like murmuring all the time. And so they get bit with serpents. And the Lord did not owe it to them to provide a remedy, right, a miraculous remedy, right, by, by, by lifting up that serpent. And, and the Lord says to Nicodemus, just like, just like Moses lifted up that serpent, the Son of Man must be lifted up, explaining to him illustrating to him as a teacher how one is born again is that the Lord would be lifted up on a cross which we and I did not deserve you, like we deserve the judgment of God we, we really do right but but in in the Lord's mercy right because this is who he is he sends his son to be lifted up on a cross and he tells us this again second Corinthians 521 that he made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the gospel. And, the, and it finds its origin in God. Number two, the gospel has its origin, not just in God, right? In God, yes, of course. But the verse says that it's in his love. Because it says, for God so loved the world, right? So the, this, little, this little word, so, right? 
For God so, in this way, God loved the world. So the gospel has its origin in God, but it has its origin in the love of God. And this word love, I'm sure David, like, you know, he's talked to you guys about, like, love, agape, right? This is the, this is the highest form of love. This is a single lane kind of love. And what I mean by a single lane kind of love is, see, our, our love tends to be, you know, two lanes, right? Like, if you, if, if you love me, then like, or, then, like, I'll love you. But if you do me wrong, like, you know, like, we, you better watch out, you know? But God's love is not like that. And I don't, like, like it does, that, that does not come natural to me. That doesn't, that's not, that's not, that's not a human thing. Like, this is, this is, this is a God love where, where God, independent of what we do, amazing and mysteriously to me, like the Lord, this is the way he loves and challenges us, right? Like, for instance, Matthew 5, 46, the Lord says, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Or Romans 5, look, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man, one will die. Yet perhaps a good man, someone would even dare die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel has its origin in God. It has its origin in the love of God. And number three, the gospel has a target audience. Because it goes on to say, for God so loved the world. The love of God is not something philosophical, theoretical. No, the love of God has a target audience. And that target audience the world is not a very lovable group of people because, you know, I mean, like I know myself, you know. I mean, look at our world. Um, some of the people that we sadly as a, as a church at large look at and are annoyed with and rant about, God looks at and says, that's my target audience. Like, I, loved, I loved those people. Just like I loved you when you were lost in your sin. Like I, like, I love those people. God's love is not theoretical. It's not philosophical. It, 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 it has a target audience, and it's, and it's huge. It's, it's, it's the entire world. You know, throughout history, it's crazy. There's always been groups of people that have thought that they were, like, God's uh, favorite. You know, it's, it's weird. I mean, he's talking here to, to, to a religious leader, you know, people of Israel who thought that they were, you know, God's special, you know, unique, and, they, you know, and God's people, of course. But, but God, for the longest, even, even in the time of Moses, God's heart was always to reach the nations. As a matter of fact, it, you know, if you know the Bible, that was God's intent for not just the, the tribe of Levi, but he wanted, the Lord wanted in, the entire Israel to be a kingdom of priests. But because of their disobedience, the Lord chose the tribe of Levi, right? So, yeah, no, God's heart is for the entire world. He loves the entire world, even when the world um, acts like the world, because that's, you know, that's, what they are, that's, what we, that's what we acted like, you know? And yet God, God in his mercy, he, he, he loves us. Revelation 5, 9 through 10, it tells us there that at the end, um, we will see from every tribe, tongue, what well, it says there. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For, we were slain, for, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. In, in my Bible there in Revelation 5, uh, 9 through 10, I, I, I have it marked right there because it says of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation in my Bible, I put this is the fruit of missions. Because missions is, it, man, that is, that, is our, that, that is our objective as a church at large. You know, that, that's why like, I rejoice in the, in the work that God is doing here um, because I know that uh, David um, has given him a, a church planting heart. And uh, I share that. I share that heart. I think that that is what we're supposed to be doing, you know. 
And so, again, I covet your prayers because we right now in the Sousa have been through a very difficult time, you know, as you can imagine. And, uh, but the Lord is uh, doing something beautiful right now among us, and he is um, he's rebuilding and he's re-strengthening. Uh, but with it, man, as you would imagine, have come these crazy attacks um, because the enemy is watching, just like you guys. You know, the enemy's watching you guys, and and he sees the direction that we are going in, you know, like all of us trying to serve the Lord, trying to advance the kingdom of God, and the enemy is not happy with that. But missions, whether it's here at home or whether it's out in the foreign field, that's what we're about because we see in the end that imagine, wouldn't it be cool, right, like where it says every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, wouldn't it be cool, right, like that when you get to heaven, right, that, that, that you would meet someone from, let's say, I don't know, Cuba or Africa or China or whatever, whatever missions that you guys are involved in, and that they would come up to you and say to you, hey, you know what, man, like I am here because you so faithfully supported or maybe because you personally went to the mission field, and that's why I'm here. And, and when I read this right here in Revelation 5 and talks about that every tribe, tongue, and, and people and nation, I'm like, what we are doing is, is so worth it. Whatever happens, whatever the enemy throws at us, man, like this is the end game right here. That we would be gathered around the throne of God with brothers and sisters from the four corners of the world, right, just worshiping him, right? That, that's, what this is, that's what we're about. So the gospel has its origin in God, its origin in the love of God, and its target audience is huge, right? It's the entire world. Number four, the gospel is, its, is expressive in its love because it says there, for God so loved the world that he gave. The gospel is, is expressive in its love. See, God's love, and, and really all, all, all love, gives uh, let, me, let me pose this question to you. Can, can you, can you um, give without love? No, I, I, I think you can. Like, I think we do it all the time. Like, we, give, uh, we give our time. Sometimes we, <laughs> we give our, our money because we, we got to pay bills. You know? like, I don't like bills. I don't know if any of you guys like bills. You know? So we can give right, uh, without loving. We, we, we have our jobs. Like when you have jobs, right? like sometimes we go to work. We don't want to go to work. We don't necessarily love our jobs, but... Well, you know, we go to work, you know, and we give up our time, um, even though we don't, it's not something that we love. So I, I, I do think that it is possible to give without loving, but, but you cannot love without giving. It, it, is, it is just impossible. And I'm not talking money here. I'm talking th that too, you know, like because we give to the cause of Christ. But more than that, when we truly love, we, we, we like, it's inevitable, like, we seek to express that love. Um, like, for instance, right, like uh, those parents in here, we love our kids, right? And our kids can just be the most obnoxious children, right? And, and yet, because we love them, we want to bless them, you know? So, like, Christmas time comes around, and no matter how they behave during the year, like, as a parent, like, you guys know how this goes, right? Like, you, you, you yeah, you, you love them, and so you want to express your love, and and, and you want to, yeah, you want to bless them because love, love, uh, love gives. And so when the Lord, when the Lord captures a human heart, um, there is born in our hearts this like uh, need, uh, like sort of compulsive need to express that love to God. And th this is, this is where, like, this is where like the spring of worship happens, that the love the love that is born inside of us for what God has done in us, that, that is where true worship comes from, see? Because uh, love always expresses itself. I'm talking time. I'm, ta I'm talking talent. I'm talking resources for the cause of the one who loved us and gave himself completely for us. We, we can never, can never outgive him, right? Second Chronicles 29, 14, this is, I think it was Solomon who said this. Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you 
I mean, you know, if you have musical ability, if you have resources that, that you know, like everything has give, been given to you from God. And God is never like saying, like, please give, like, or else, like, my business could fall apart. Like, God doesn't need anything from us. But love seeks to express itself. And this is what this is saying, that God so loved the world that he gave. Because true love always seeks expression. Proverbs 27, 5. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. In other words, you know, I'd rather you rebuke me than you tell me you love me, but you never, like, express it. Because at least if you rebuke me, you're, like, telling me that you care enough for me to call me out on something that I'm not, like, you know, like, that you, that you care for me, right? Because true love really seeks to express itself. Now, here in John 3.16, we see the expression of love from the Father, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? This God, gave the, God loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But, you know, in, in, in Galatians 2.20, we have the expression of love, not from the Father, but from the Son. Look at what Galatians 2.20 says. I have been crucified with Christ. This no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Galatians 2.20. I, I love Galatians 2.20 because in John 3.16, it is the expression of love is, is in, the, in, the, in the big, right? So like God so loved the world, right? But Galatians 2.20, it's more personal. Galatians 2.20, he's talking about who loved me. And gave himself for me. But now I need to ask you something that, like, when I consider these things, it's sort of a convicting question that the Lord kind of always uh, poses to me. See, if, if Galatians 2.20 is telling you and I that when the Lord gave himself for us, the degree that he gave himself for us was not half-hearted. No, the Lord gave himself for you and I completely. And so then, and so then how should then I, how, how should then we give ourselves to him? The implication here is that the only reasonable thing that we can do is to offer ourselves as living sacrifices completely to him. Because he gave himself completely for us. Now, what are you, at this moment, giving yourself to? Please, I, and I feel like I need to like, like stress this upon you, like, because I'm not asking you, what is it that you are saying that you love? What I'm asking you is, what are you for real loving? Because what you are for real loving right now is what you are giving yourself habitu habitually, continually to. It is that which consumes your mind. It is that which consumes your time, your resources. It's what you're giving yourself to. That is what you love. And I'm not saying this to put some sort of like condemnation on you. Far from it. I'm saying this to you so that you would, so that you would reconsider or take inventory of your worshiping heart. Because look it. Everyone worships something or someone. Even atheists, whether they realize it or not, are worshiping something. Usually it's intellect. We are called to worship, right, our, our God. In, in the way that we express our worship to him out of a fountain of love for what he's done for us. And that is seen, again, in how we express our love. You know, all, all love, all love is not good. Uh, generations ago, the whole, the, the mantra was, uh, all you need is love. Uh, today, the mantra seems to be, love is love, uh, right? You, you guys know what I, what I mean by that. That is the generation we're living in. It's just like, hey, man, like, just as, as long as, like, 
they love each other as long as it's like, as long as it's love. It's like love has become God. And love is not God. God is love, but love is not God. And let, let me pose this to you. So like, like imagine, imagine a, a culture that um, loved God, like for real loved God. What would that culture look like? Well, it would look like in... It, it would look like in the way that they expressed that love, right? So a, a culture that loved God would express its love in their um, pursuit of things that please God, right? In, 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 in righteous living, in, um, man, if, if, if our culture loved God, the influence that this country has, Oh my goodness, man! We this world would be like another. This world would be different, right? Like it would be because because we would be about the the work of God and the in the in the and the proclamation of the gospel to the nations, right? Like, uh, yeah, like it would be a culture that you would look at and be like, there is a culture that loves God because look at the the way that they're expressing their love is evident that they love the things that God loves. But what if a culture um, loved things that God says are evil. What would that culture look like? Well, I post to you that that culture would love immorality, would love arrogance, would exalt arrogance, actually, would say things like, you're not going to tell me what a marriage looks like. We will define what a marriage and life even is well that is the culture that we're living in in and in the name of love this is this is what's going down because the issue is always love love is always expressive in john 3 at the end of this chapter here and in, 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 from verse 19 to 20 it says that uh, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. You see, the issue is always love. You know, in, in Spanish, I like the way that it puts it in Spanish. If you speak Spanish there, it says that the, the, um, where it says, that, and, and men love darkness rather than light. In Spanish, it says, amaron mas las tinieblas. They, they, they love the darkness more. You know, because like sometimes I'll talk to people and be like, they'll be like, oh, I love God. And I don't doubt that like in their twisted way of thinking, they have some sort of version of love. But the issue is, is that you love darkness, mas que Dios, more than God. And because love is expressive. It always will express itself. And you observe your life and how is your life expressing love? What are, you, what are you loving? What are you expressing your love towards? The gospel has its origin in God. Its origin in the love of God has the target audience, which is huge, is the entire world. And it's always expressive because God so loved the world that he gave. Number five, the gospel is extravagant in the way that it expresses its love. Because it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So what God gives is like extravagant, right? So like it says there, his only begotten son. This word begotten, uh, monogenes, I think is the word. It, it, it talk, it's about, it, it refers to one of its kind. So, so when it says, his only begotten son, it's talking about that obviously no one like him, right? Like this is God in the flesh. Um, that's, that's who God gave. He did not like, he, he, he did not like um, give his, the, you know, he gave the best. And, and I love how like when he's talking about this, right, he's talking to us about the idea of a son. And this is like, again, God being the master teacher. Uh, when he's teaching us uh, these like deep concepts, right? Like very, very simple, right? So like when the Lord would teach about, um, about the kingdom of God, he'd say things like, um, 
you know, he, he's talking to a, a culture that's agricultural, right? And so he would be like, a sower went out to, to sow, right? And he threw, threw seeds, right? And, and, and some seed landed here. And, and, and so the, the, the people he was speaking to, like, they'd understand that, right? Because they understood what it was to plant. So in here, it talks to us about that he gave his only begotten son. I'm a father of four, of four boys. I don't know if you have children, but if you have children, you understand that, my goodness, look, I can, like, I can like someone, I could even love someone, but, man, I have a really difficult time even imagining that I would be willing to sacrifice the life of one of my boys for someone that I even like and love. And yet here we have God telling us that he gave his only begotten son. He gave the best, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's amazing, right? Because, because it's not like he gave his son when we were behaving. No, he gave his son when we were like at our worst. The fact that it says gave implies a gift. Isaiah 9.6 tells us that unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But the idea there is that it implies a gift. And it implies also the purpose why he was given, right? The fact that it says that he gave, we know, and in the conversation, the Lord goes on to say, right, that like for, for sacrifice. And... Um, and that's, that's an amazing uh, idea to me because the cross, as you have been taught, was not plan B for God. The cross was from the beginning, for like Adam and Eve, like, like the promise was given, right, like to, to the serpent, actually, after they had sinned, that this was going to happen. It was from eternity past in 1 Peter um, 1, 18 to 21. Uh, Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as, a, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. What do we do with this in our day? How would this affect us? You know, the fact that, that when we were sinners, right? Romans 5, 8, that before the foundations of the earth, God had ordained that he would come to earth to die for our sins, that he would give his best. This expression of love that he gave for us is not cheap. You know, often we will say things like, you know, the salvation is free, right? Like we and praise God, you know, that it is. But it wasn't cheap. I mean, like it was paid for by, by his blood. Like his love, his love is extravagant. His expression of love is extravagant. He did not spare his own son, Romans 8.32 tells us, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is our Father's extravagant love for us. So the gospel has its origin in God, its origin in the love of God, has a target audience, it's the world, it's huge, it's expressive, it's extravagant in its expression of love. And then the last thing, has an extremely, extremely important purpose, the most important purpose for us, depending on what we do with it. And this is how we'll end. So the extremely important purpose in the gospel as it refers to us is, is this, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And here it is. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a negative and a positive to this. I'm going to give you first the negative because I want to end with the positive. The, 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 the negative is that whoever believes in him should not perish. Now, by implication, the fact that he says should not perish, this word perish, it, it, it talks about destruction eternally. 
but not destruction where you cease to exist. If you dig into it, you, you, you'll learn that the Lord Jesus spoke about a place called hell as a literal place, Luke uh, 16. Um, hell is a real place. And so when it's talking about here that whoever believes in him should not perish, it is implying by logic that there will be some who will perish in this way. By reasoning, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, please hear me out here. The fact that Jesus died on the cross does not mean that everybody is automatically saved. Because we hear that sometimes, you know, like uh, people who are living just like, like, like the devil. And when you talk to them, they'll say like, you know, like they believe that because Jesus died on, on, on the cross that they're good. But when you like kind of start talking to them, you start to see that there is no even the slightest hint of God's spirit in them. There is no repentance in them. It's just something that they've been told, that they've heard that Jesus died on died. And, and, and so, but but here, when it's talking about believing, it's talking about biblical believing, right? But some will perish in this way, unnecessarily, because a loving God who we've sinned against so that we wouldn't go to hell provided a way, one way, only one way so that we would not go to hell. And that's the sacrifice of Jesus. But that sacrifice needs to be embraced. Sometimes people are like, I don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. You, you guys probably heard this too, right? And um, when I was younger, you know, before the Lord uh, mercifully rescued me, I used to think this way. I used to think, like, how would, how would a loving God send people to hell? You know, you're telling me God loves me, but then you're telling me about this horrible place called hell, and people are going to go there for eternity and suffer and all this, right? And, like, how can God do something like that? Well, when we talk like that, the reason is because we don't really um, think that what we've done is, is that serious. But when we start, like, seeing God for who he is, I mean, absolute perfection. You know, the Bible says that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, right? That's what it says. When we, um, when we sin against a kind, merciful God, who time and time and time and time again continues to pour out grace on us, continues to give us breath of life, a beating heart, food to eat. I mean, just pours out blessings on us, right? Even when we were lost. But when we continue to sin against him, and I've lived long enough to have seen the depths of depravity that a human can sink to, hell sort of makes a little bit more sense to me. Because there are some people who are in open rebellion to God. You know, when the Lord walked this earth, uh, people literally spit in his face. We, in our culture, essentially are spitting in the face of God. We as a culture are lifting our fist up to God and saying to him, we will not have you reign over us. We will not tell you, we will not allow you to tell us how to live. We will live how we want to live. And so God in his justice and perfection would say in John 3.36, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Because the wrath of God is part of the gospel. I think it's Romans 1, right out verse 16, where it says that I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And then it says, for in it also the, the wrath of God is revealed. Because in the gospel, it does have this dual element where like, yes, absolutely, the righteousness of God given to us by faith. But there is the wrath of God. And that's the whole reason why we need to be saved. Because like, if there is no wrath of God, then what do we need to be saved from? No, the wrath of God is real. 
And here in John 3.16, it's talking about that whoever believes in him should not perish, implying that some will perish unnecessarily. Now, the positive element. That he who believes in him should not perish, but have ever, but whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love how it says whoever, right? This speaks of whoever, the entire world. This, this, is, this is available to you and I. This is what we get to proclaim. This is what we, we get to say to people, look, man, you, like, no matter what you've done, bro, like, like, it's like, like, you know, sometimes, like, people are so, like, steeped in, 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 in guilt for what they've done because we're guilty. That's why we feel guilty is because we are guilty, right? But we're, a, we're able to go and say to a person, look, the Lord delivered me from X, Y, and C, and, and the Lord, man, if he's done that in my life, bro, like, I, like, the Lord can forgive you for what you've done. Whoever believes in him, but you do need to believe in him, biblically speaking. Recently, I was having a conversation with someone, and this person was telling me that they believe in God. And I was telling him, you know, it's crazy because, like, the Bible says that the devil also believes in God. But it does him no good, right? The devil believing in God, the devil believing in God does him no good. Because the devil's whole existence is in opposition to God. And a lot of humans, sadly, even humans that attend churches, believe in God in the way that the devil believes in God. And I beg you, in the name of Jesus, don't believe in God that way. Believe in God the way that the Bible says to believe in God. And that means full surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. That way, believe in God. That whoever believes in God should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life now this this eternal life that it talks about here is the life of god because really only god is eternal and if you did dug into the original word you would find that this eternal life that it's speaking of is the life of the holy spirit is the life of god that that wants to be given it's not speaking about living forever everyone though i mean everyone will live forever in one of two places, heaven or hell. Um, here it's saying that whoever believes in God, it, 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 in Jesus, right, and the one that was given to us would have eternal life. And I would ask you this evening, have you believed in God like that? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus, the one that was given for our sins, to the salvation of your soul? Do you have eternal life? And if your answer is yes, man, praise God. But then I would again challenge you, how is that being expressed in your life? The gospel has its origin in God. Its origin in the love of God. Its target is huge. It's the entire world. It's expressive. It is extravagant in its expression. And it has a very important purpose in our life. Because the way that we respond to this gospel, this simple gospel, that God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, right? That we, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The way we respond to this, whether we accept it or reject it, will determine where we spend eternity. We are running out of time. We really are. And it is, it is, it is, it, there, it's never been a time to play around with God. Never. But man, if there was ever for real a time to not play around with God, we are living in that time right now. And you need to surrender to Jesus Christ. You, 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 need, to, you need to turn your back on whatever sin you're playing with. That sin is destroying you. And God wants to deliver you from that and give you abundant life. Mm -hmm.